morning to all participants who are now entering this webinar. Welcome to you all. We are very pleased uh, to see how many people have registered for this event. My name is Jonathan Goldsmith and I work with the European Lawyers Foundation. This seminar today is the first of a series of webinars being put on by the European Lawyers Foundation, ELF, and the Council of Bars and Law Societies of Europe, CCBE. This series is being coordinated by the Managing Director of the ELF, Alonso Hernandez Pinzon. And this series of webinars deals with the consequences for lawyers of the invasion of Ukraine by Russia. The webinar today is on the role of lawyers in relation to Ukraine and the International Criminal Court. It'll be followed by another webinar, also organized by ELF and CCBE, on the topic of EU sanctions following the invasion of U Ukraine. And that one will take place on the 15th of June 2022 from 9 to 11. More information on this second uh, seminar, webinar, will be published next week. So please follow ELF and CCBE websites and or social media to obtain the programme and register for the event. I now have some uh, further announcements to make since the numbers who've now come into the room are more and I, we will talk about the etiquette for today's webinar. So please, will you use the question and answer box which you will find at the bottom of your screen for posing any questions to the speakers. We welcome all questions uh, and the more questions you can pose, the happier we will be. Um, do not put the questions in the chat function. Please put the questions in the question and answer box, which you will see. You're more than welcome to use the chat function to say hello. We like that. If you tell us who you are and where you come from in the chat function, so we see uh, from what a wide range of countries our participants come, we'll be very happy. So as I say, put your questions in the uh, question and answer box, uh, not in the chat function. We will try to answer all the questions, but there are a good number of participants who have registered, and so we can't promise to answer all questions, but we will uh, try our best to do so. So we now move to the opening of this webinar. As I say, it is called Ukraine and the International Criminal Court, the role of lawyers. And I would first like to welcome James McGuill, former president of the Law Society of Ireland, now president of the Council of Bars and Law Societies of Europe, CCBE, to give an opening address. The CCBE represents over a million lawyers through their member bars and law societies. James, over to you. Thank you, Jonathan. <clears throat> and again, congratulations to Alonso and to Jonathan for putting together this tremendous um, webinar for us today. It's just almost three months to the day since the 24th of February, when the world and Europe in particular were shocked by the illegal actions of Vladimir Putin and the Russian Federation. Uh, the intervening three months have shown us the scale of the atrocities that have been committed. And broader society, lawyers in particular, need a legal resolution to this. The rule of law has been violated, it must be protected, public confidence must be restored, and the International Criminal Court is one of the really important instruments available uh, to society to redress those atrocities. So I welcome the webinar today. I think colleagues need to be fully informed about the uh, potential and the limitations of the International Criminal Court. And even if colleagues aren't actually going to be engaged in the work of the court, it's important that as lawyers, we can communicate to civil society what can be done to protect the rule of law and what the International Criminal Court stands for. Uh, we need to make sure that the people ultimately responsible for these war crimes are made accountable, but that the process is a transparent and fair one. And the rule of law does not admit of, um, you know, knee-jerk justice. We need to have a court that people have confidence in and that convictions are credible and sustainable. Uh, I look forward to 
the webinar today. I, I look forward to all the steps that lawyers can take uh, to assist uh, the protection of the people of Ukraine. And that includes the work that are, is being done by our migration lawyers to protect refugees, work that is being done to assist our colleagues in having their qualifications recognized and securing meaningful employment, uh, the taking of witness statements and providing them to the a prosecutor in The Hague, and of course, critically, to look at potential domestic remedies in terms of the international jurisprudence and jurisdiction on war crimes. The work on sanctions, which will be addressed in the webinar on the 15th of June, is vitally important. And it must be borne in mind that those who breach the sanctions and enable people to breach the sanctions are anathema to the legal community. So with those few words, I, I wish you a very successful webinar. And again, I'd like to congratulate the European Lawyers Foundation for bringing together such tremendous speakers that I'm looking forward to hearing from in the course of this morning. Thank you very much, James. Uh, we are very pleased to have your welcome. And we now move on to the substance of the webinar. And uh, our first topic is the International Criminal Court and the Rome Statute. And our speaker will be Renan Viasis. Uh, Renan uh, studied law at the University of Cuenca in Ecuador and then international relations at the School of Advanced International Studies at the John Hopkins University, Washington, D.C. Before he joined the Secretariat of the Assembly at the ICC, he'd worked as a member of the Foreign Service of Ecuador and then as a legal officer in the Codification Division of the Office of Legal Affairs of the United Nations Secretariat in New York. Since 2006, he's been Director of the Secretariat at the ICC. So, Renan, over to you, please. Thank you very much, uh, dear Jonathan. Good morning to everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you. And indeed, I want to start by thanking the organizers uh, for this timely event, which is taking place at a moment of intense focus on the ICC, given the role that it plays and the enormous expectation that has been placed upon the court. We've had that since the court was created, but I think this year in particular, that has come to one of the highest levels of, of expectation we've ever been faced with. <laughs> Uh, I have the honor to be able to speak in this first part of the webinar about the ICC and the Rome Statute. Uh, this will allow me an opportunity to refer to the context which must be borne in mind for any situation in which the court may have a role, not just in the case of Ukraine. Normally courses on the ICC last at least an entire week because it is an extremely complex um, institution that was set up uh, almost 25 uh, years ago. Uh, but I will try to compress that, focusing on the broader aspects of the court and its jurisdiction, and referring, of course, to the situation in Ukraine to the extent that I can. You will understand that I will not be able to really refer to the judicial aspects uh, of a specific situation or a case which the court is actively seized of. Uh, let me start by remarking that we are commemorating this year the 20th anniversary of the entry into force of the Rome Statute. Because as of the 1st of July in 2002, a novel international legal regime came into existence. This constituted a true watershed between the period before and afterwards. The existence of the ICC altered significantly the international criminal law because as of that moment, for the first time, the international community has a permanent international criminal court and it was established by the sovereign will of the entire international community. I must stress the words permanent and international community for the reasons that I will elaborate on uh, a bit later. What exactly was established in Rome back in 1998? It's not the ICC as such, it's not the physical building that you see in, in, in some of the publications and uh, in which I am located now. What Rome established in 98 was a true system the ICC is just the most visible and well-known part of that system. Let me briefly refer to some of the key features of the system, which I will then be developing. The ICC has jurisdiction over four crimes, genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, and the crime of aggression. It has jurisdiction over an individual who commits a crime or gives an order to execute a crime. In other words, individual criminal responsibility. 
the ICC intends to prosecute only the most responsible individuals. It does not prosecute states nor legal entities. And it only has jurisdiction over individual crimes committed since the 1st of July of 2002, when the treaty entered into force. Furthermore, the ICC investigates and prosecutes the crimes committed on the territory of a state party or by a national of a state party. The ICC can also investigate and prosecute when a state which is not a party accepts the ICC jurisdiction or when the United Nations Security Council refers a situation to the ICC. The ICC can also investigate and prosecute when a state does not investigate or prosecute or is unwilling or unable to do so genuinely. I will now proceed to explain some of these points and, and make particular reference to the case of Ukraine. Unlike other international tribunals and courts which preceded its existence, the ICC itself does not exist as a standalone institution entrusted with the investigation and prosecution of atrocity crimes. What the international community agreed to in Rome was the system that I referred to before, which is based on the bedrock principle of complementarity. This is fundamental because it means first and foremost that the primary responsibility for the investigation and the prosecution of these heinous crimes falls upon the states which have jurisdiction over those crimes. This principle of complementarity had been a core point in the negotiations of the Rome Statute. It was deemed by many of those participants to be an essential condition for reaching an agreement to even have an ICC. It is indeed doubtful whether many states would have agreed to that international treaty, establishing any kind of court which could have primacy in conducting criminal investigations into acts which occurred on its territory or in So this is one key point that needs to be borne in mind. The ICC has a supplementary role for investigations and prosecutions. It can only complement that which is undertaken at the national level by the national jurisdictions. This essential point is um, not always clearly understood by the general public, but it lies at the core of the system that was established in 1998. Moving on, what are the crimes which the ICC can investigate? And investigate? The preamble of the statute refers to the most serious crimes of concern to the international community as a whole. And we, we tend to use the word atrocity crimes uh, to refer to them in a general Renan, way. Can I, Renan, can I just interrupt you? Your papers are too close to the microphone and when you shuffle, they make a big noise. If you can take care. Sorry to interrupt you, Renan. On you go. Thank you. Sorry about that. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, the, the crimes that the court deals with are genocide, crimes against humanity, the war crimes and the crimes of aggression. And the negotiations over several years, which culminated in 1998, codified the state of international criminal law of the first three crimes. You will find that in Article 5 of the statute. The crime of aggression, which has also been referred to a lot lately, uh, included, was included in Article 5, but we had to wait until 2010 to have that crime legally defined uh, via the amendments to Article 8 of the statute that were adopted in 2010. This then leads to the question, when can the ICC investigate? and prosecute the atrocity crimes? Well, when the crimes have been committed on the territory of a state party or by a national of a state party. And currently we have 123 states parties to the Rome Statute. Neither Ukraine nor the Russian Federation are parties. However, as mentioned before, the statute does foresee jurisdiction for the ICC when a state which is not a party, accepts the ICC jurisdiction. Ukraine has made two such declarations under Article 12, Paragraph 3 of the statute. In the first declaration, Ukraine accepted the ICC jurisdiction with respect to alleged crimes committed on Ukrainian territory from the 21st of November 2013 until the 22nd of February 2014. The second declaration extended this time period on an open-ended basis to encompass ongoing alleged crimes committed throughout the territory of Ukraine from the 20th of February, 2014 onwards. 
These two declarations constitute the legal basis for the ICC to be able to exercise its jurisdiction. In terms of how exactly the ICC would be authorized to start an investigation, there is a standard procedure that's set out in the statute, whereby the prosecutor has to request an authorization from what is called the pre-trial chamber. In other words, it's a chamber composed of three judges, which is again the result of the extensive negotiations that were held in the latter part of the 1990s when uh, we were negotiating the Rome Statute. Uh, there were concerns back then, very serious ones, by some states about the possibility of having what was called a, a runaway prosecutor uh, who could perhaps embark upon politically motivated investigations. And therefore, the agreement in the statute was that the pretrial chamber would serve the purpose of a kind of filter. So that's its three judges would then need to authorize, grant the authorization that was requested by the prosecutor uh, before uh, he or she could open an investigation. On the 28th of February of this year, the prosecutor of the ICC announced his decision to request an authorization to open investigation into the situation in Ukraine on the basis of the earlier conclusions reached by his office arising from its preliminary examination and encompassing any new alleged crimes falling within the jurisdiction of the ICC. He notified the ICC presidency at the time that the OTP would immediately proceed with active investigations in the situation in Ukraine and that its work in the collection of evidence had commenced. Therefore, initially, the filter that I referred to before was being activated. The judges then had to consider if there was a reasonable basis to proceed with an investigation based upon their examination of the prosecutor's request and the supporting material. But then uh, something which rarely occurs at the ICC happened. Um, instead of having to wait for the authorization and to be the decision of the pretrial chamber to open the investigation, uh, the OTP received referrals from 39 states parties um, referring the situation in Ukraine to the ICC. And these were based on articles 13A and 14.1 of the Rome Statute. This basically allows the prosecutor to immediately open an investigation and to commence the collection of the evidence. In the following days, additional states have joined that initial group. So now there's a total of 43 states parties which have referred the situation in Ukraine to the ICC. That is a significant number as the referral of situations by states parties is quite rare and the figure amounts to over one third of the members of the Rome Statute. Let me now turn to the key aspect mentioned earlier about who the ICC can investigate and the related matter of what it cannot investigate. The ICC only has jurisdiction over an individual who commits the crime or gives the order to execute the crime. And the ICC does not investigate nor prosecute a state or any legal entity. Furthermore, even when the ICC has jurisdiction, it can only investigate and prosecute the individuals who are most responsible for the commission of the atrocity crimes. Unfortunately, the ICC cannot investigate all the crimes which may have been committed in a given situation as it was not set up to do that. What about the temporal jurisdiction? Well, in principle, the ICC can only exercise its jurisdiction over the individual crimes committed since the 1st of July, 2002. However, when a non-state party makes the declaration under Article 12, Paragraph 3 of the Rome Statute to give the court jurisdiction, it indicates a specific date or period for that purpose. In the case of Ukraine, that period starts started on the 21st of November, 2013. Let me now refer to the crime of aggression, which has been mentioned frequently in, the, in regards to the situation in Ukraine. It was included in Article 5 of the Rome Statute back in 1998, but the court only has jurisdiction over the crime of aggression if the respective state is party to the amendments to Article 8. Those amendments inter alia define the crime of aggression. The Assembly of States parties decided that the court could exercise its jurisdiction over the crime of aggression as of the 17th of July, 2018. But again, that temporal 
period can only apply to the states which are parties as of that particular date or when, when it enters into force for them. There are a few dozen that are parties to the amendments of the crime of aggression, um, but uh, uh, many of the larger members of the ICC system and of course others uh, are not parties. So that is, uh, is a key element. Uh, and as I indicated before, neither Ukraine nor the Russian Federation are parties to the Rome Statute nor to those amendments. Let me refer now briefly to the key point I made earlier about the ICC also being able to investigate and prosecute when a state does not investigate or prosecute or is unwilling or unable to do so. This is another feature of the statute which seeks to combat impunity for atrocity crimes. However, in the case of the situation in Ukraine, there are different investigations underway. First and foremost, by the territorial state itself but also by other states and by the ICC. It's worth recalling that on the 25th of April of this year, the ICC prosecutor signed an agreement whereby his office became a participant under the auspices of Eurojust in the Joint Investigation Team or JIT on alleged core international crimes committed in Ukraine, joining Lithuania, Poland and Ukraine in that endeavor. In the view of the prosecutor, the Ukraine situation in particular demands collective action so as to secure relevant evidence and ultimately ensure its effective use in criminal proceedings. The JIT aims to facilitate investigations and prosecutions in the concerned states, as well as those that could be taken forward to, before the ICC. Through its participation in the JIT, the Office of the Prosecutor will significantly enhance its ability to access and collect information relevant to its own independent investigations. The OTP will be able to conduct rapid and real-time coordination and cooperation with the JIT partner countries. The ICC prosecutor then highlighted that in line with the principle of complementarity that I had indicated was the bedrock of the system, the OTP wants to serve as an effective partner with respect to the conduct of domestic proceedings in relation to core international crimes, and it would do so by seeking to identify all the opportunities through which it can provide information and evidence to the concerned national authorities. Reflecting the independent nature of the mandate of the Office of the Prosecutor, such provision of assistance and information will be carried out on a case-by-case -case basis and in a manner consistent with the Rome Statute. What is actually happening on the ground now in Ukraine? Well, the Office of the Prosecutor of the ICC uh, is extremely active. Uh, it has a team of 42 investigators, forensic experts, and support personnel in Ukraine. The OTP has requested and has received offers of voluntary contributions from 20 states, because basically the resources that uh, we approve annually in the assembly uh, are, in the view of the prosecutor, um, not sufficient to meet this enormous uh, new undertaking. It has also received uh, offers of uh, having seconded personnel or national experts basically be uh, provided to the ICC from 21 states to assist it with the general mandate, uh, not specifically oriented towards the situation in Ukraine. Now, what are the next steps? This, this, this would be a, a, a bit of a, of course, um, going into the future. And uh, I don't think necessarily we can do that but because the investigations are ongoing. But you will have, in the case of the ICC, the pre-trial chamber looking at the evidence that the Office of the Prosecutor has submitted. Uh, if that continues going forward, you, you reach the trial and you then continue, of course, with the appeals if that is uh, also something that uh, comes up in the context of the proceedings. But I think those, those aspects of the uh, future steps to be taken are probably going to be considered at one of these uh, series of seminars and webinars that our colleagues at the, uh, at the European Foundation um, for lawyers have undertaken. What is the role of, of the lawyers in the system? Let me refer briefly to that. Our role, because I happen to be one of them, is key. But it's not just regarding the judicial proceedings. We are all fully committed to the rule of law and thus of international criminal law. We all wish to see justice prevail. And that means fair and impartial trials. There are more specific roles for lawyers which some of my fellow panelists may touch upon related more specifically to the proceedings. 
but even as ordinary citizens in our countries and as citizens of the world, by supporting and promoting the rule of law, we are already contributing to the cause of justice. Before concluding my intervention, please let me return to the points I emphasized at the beginning on the permanent nature of the ICC and on the sovereign will of the international community when it was established. The ICC is here to stay in the international arena. It has a fundamental role to play, bearing always in mind the principle of complementarity. New challenges arise regularly, but the Rome Statute system, which is nearing its 20th year in a few more weeks, has proven its resilience. If the myriad declarations and statements of the commitment to combat impunity for heinous crimes are to result in true accountability, then the Rome Statute and the system it established must continue to receive the broad support needed to be able to contribute always within the mandate to that end. The entire international community was invited and took part in the negotiations which over several years reached their zenith in the Eternal City on the 17th of July, 1998, when the Rome Statute was adopted. And it is thus the same international community which should continue its unstinting support of the system it established so that the aim of ensuring accountability and combating impunity for atrocity crimes comes to fruition. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you very much, uh, Renan. Uh, indeed, thank you very much. I say to the participants, we have a few minutes if you've got questions for Renan, I'm going to speak and uh, talk about some of the questions which have been put, which weren't addressed specifically to you. And in that time, if people have questions for Renan, please put them before we move on to the next session. Uh, some people asked about interpretation into uh, Italian and into uh, Spanish, for instance. Uh, there is no interpretation. Uh, this uh, set webinar will be held in English only. We had a, a very interesting question from a Ukrainian uh, lawyer uh, who asked about help for victims. That is coming up. That will be the next session. And so I would ask him and anybody else who has questions about assistance for victims uh, to put your questions to the next session. And somebody else asked about um, whether they could have a recording of this meeting. Um, and this meeting is being recorded, as you will see. Um, and the recording will be made available next week. It'll be disseminated through the European Lawyers Foundation social media, so LinkedIn and Twitter accounts. So if you want the recording, please look there next week. Uh, that being said, I don't see any uh, further questions for you, uh, Renan, which is good because you've given such a comprehensive account. If you have any uh, final uh, things to say, now's your chance. Otherwise, we, ah, there is a question which has just been put in the box. Uh, yes, uh, from Tobias Pilot, Tobias Pilot. Could you show us some examples of how a common lawyer, oh, so it's Tobias Pilot, could you show us some examples of how a common lawyer could get involved as such in a process before the International uh, Criminal Court? Renan, you have frozen, Renan. You're on mute. Ah, at this crucial point, it looks as if Renan is not available. Um, we might come back to Renan. There are questions and answers uh, at a question and answer session at the end. And we will, so uh, Tobias, we will hold on to your question. And then at the end, when we have a general question and answer session, I will ask uh, Renan that question when he's resolved his technical problems. Uh, we will move on now uh, to the next session. Um, and we here have two speakers. This is uh, the Ukrainian situation and the participation of victims before the International Criminal Court. Uh, we have two speakers, as I say, Paulina Masida, who is Principal Counsel of the Independent Office of Public Counsel for Victims at the ICC, and Dmitry Suprun, who is Counsel of the Independent Office of 
Public Council for Victims at the ICC. Since they will speak one after the other, I will not uh, interrupt them. I'll make a joint introduction of them both now. They will speak and then at the end we'll be allowing a good amount of time for questions. So again, if you have questions for them, put them in the box. So we start with Paulina Masseda. She's an Italian lawyer, a member of the Genoa Bar since 1992. Since 2005, she's been the principal counsel of the Independent Office of Public Counsel for Victims at the International Criminal Court. And she's represented victims in proceedings before the court in almost all situations and cases with a specific experience in gender crimes and crimes against children and victims' rights and in handling cases with a high number of victims involved. Uh, before that, she worked as legal advisor for the International Federation of the Red Cross and the International Committee of the Red Cross. And she's participated as an expert in several EU training programs for judges and lawyers. As you can tell, she specialized in human rights and international humanitarian law and holds a master in international criminal law. And she's a founding member of the International Criminal Court Bar. Uh, uh, Dimitri Suprun uh, is counsel at the Independent Office of Public Counsel for Victims. Uh, he has over 23 years of professional experience relating to human rights protection and promotion, including over 15 years regarding the representation of rights of victims before the ICC. Before that, uh, he worked as a lawyer at the Registry of the European Court of Human Rights, dealing with individual applications brought against Ukraine. And before that, uh, or rather after that, 2003-2007, he was a private lawyer providing legal support and advice to applicants before the ECHR. He has a PhD in the legal, jurisdictional and organisational fundamentals of the European Court of Human Rights activities, LLB in international relations and international law from a university in Kiev, and he's the author and co-author of many publications on the, top, on the topic. So with that being said, uh, we now go over to this uh, topic on, on victims. And so I call on Paulina first. Over to you, Paulina. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Good morning to all participants, or afternoon or evening, depending on where you are at the moment. I'm very pleased to participate in this event. So allow me, first of all, to thank you very much for the invitation and this timely webinar on participation of victims before the ICC and Ukraine. Now, the issue of the participation of victims before the ICC, it's quite a broad one and you can imagine. So what we'd like to do together with Dimitro this morning is to give you a um, few explanations on how victims can contribute to the process of justice before the ICC, what they can do, and how our office, the Office of Public Council for Victims can be of help in supporting and assisting victims to access justice. Now, starting first of all with the issue of the participation of victims before the ICC, as I think everybody knows, this was quite a controversial matter to be discussed during the Rome conference. And at the end, participation of victims was considered essential in the process of justice for survivors and for victims of different types of crimes. And finally, the participation of victims was provided in the Rome Statute, despite um, several um, difficulties in getting the concept through. But finally, the participation of victims was uh, inscribed in the Rome Statute under Article 68, Paragraph 3 which provides the possibility for victims to make their voice heard and to present their views and concerns before the court when their personal interests are concerned. As Renan was pointing out a few minutes ago, there is no possibility for the victims to trigger directly the jurisdiction of the court. This is something which is reserved for states, the Security Council, or the prosecutor of proprio motto. 
but victims can contribute greatly to the uh, investigations in providing the information to the office of the prosecutor. So we have, in fact, different scenarios in which victims can be involved before the International Criminal Court. We have a standard procedure, which is Article 68, Paragraph 3, which, as I was saying, provides the possibility for victims to present their views and concerns when their personal interests are concerned. But this provision is mainly used once a proceedings start before the court, meaning when someone is summoned to appear or arrest under a warrant of arrest and a physical individual is brought and surrendered before the ICC. What if this situation is not happening? Well, if there is no formal proceedings open before the ICC, victims can still contribute in essentially presenting information to the Office of the Prosecutor. This kind of information provided by victims will help the prosecutor to shape the investigation. And I would like to stress this aspect of what victims can do to search and to look for justice because the involvement of victims at this early stage of the investigation will actually allow them to try to push, allow me this uh, expression, for a more broad investigation. If you look at the different situations and cases before the ICC, you will probably realize that the prosecution tend to have quite a narrow um, investigation for different reasons. This is not necessarily the main interest of victims in the ICC proceedings because the extent of victimization that they suffer from. So the interest for victims is mainly to see all or the majority of the crimes they suffer from be investigated and prosecuted. And the main chance that victims may have is to provide information at the time of investigation in order to try to shape, to some extent, the investigation by the Office of the Prosecutor. And this is also the reason why the involvement of lawyers at this stage is particularly important. Because victims may have a lot of information but may not be aware of the type of information which may be important or essential to provide during an investigation and on which type of crimes, for instance. So the role of lawyers in supporting victims already at this preliminary stage is essential. And I really want to underline that because the majority of the audience, if not all this morning, is of lawyers. And we already had a question from one of the participants on how lawyers may be involved in proceedings before the court. So one way that lawyers can be involved is via representation of victims at the investigation stage already in trying to provide assistance on how to provide information. In this framework, I would like to spend a few words about the Office of Public Counsel for Victims and on how this office can eventually help and support and assist victims and lawyers in seeking justice. The Office of Public Counsel for Victims is an independent office created by the regulations of the court, Regulation 80 and Regulation 81, provides for the creation of the office and for the independence of the office. The office is composed of lawyers, and we are based in VA at the seat of the court, where our operations are mainly concentrated. But we also have presence in the field when lawyers of the office are appointed in each situation country 
we have a lawyer from the country integrated in our team to help us to uh, provide legal representation to victims. Now, the office has essentially different mandates. One is the possibility for lawyers of the office to represent victims in the proceedings before the court. And this is at the moment for our main mandate. The second mandate is the um, obligation to some extent to provide support and assistance to external lawyers who may be involved with victims and who may need any support in understanding and navigating the framework and the uh, regulations of International Criminal Court, the different proceedings and the practice. The third mandate is the possibility to appeal before chambers in respect of specific issues in relation to proceedings before the court. This mandate can be activated by victims directly, by the office directly, by chambers. And it has been used mainly by chambers uh, throughout the years in asking the office to provide advice on specific issues which may have an impact on the general interest of victims. So this third mandate is essentially dealing with our task of also representing the general interest of victims in the proceedings before the court. Throughout the years, the office was created in 2005, and throughout the years, we managed to represent a little bit more than 70,000 victims in the different proceedings before the court. I would like to underline that not to say that the office is good, but simply to show you the type of experience that we have and how this experience can be put at the service of lawyers and victims in the situation in Ukraine. The office can be uh, contacted at any time. We can provide advices on any issues pertaining to victims at any stage of the proceedings, including at the preliminary examination. The contact with the office are normally confidential and not publicized because we consider that it's in the best interest of victims to preserve their security, their well-being, their dignity in interacting in a confidential way with any kind of stakeholders who may wish to uh, interact and having advice from the office itself. I will leave the floor now to uh, Dimitri to proceed on more practical issues in relation to uh, the type of help that the office can offer, and we will certainly remain uh, um, available to any questions that you may have after Dimitri's intervention. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Paulina. Thank you very much. Dimitri, you're there. Over to you. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, thank you. Uh, good morning, colleagues. Uh, good morning, everyone. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers for holding this event on such an important topic. And I appreciate that the purpose of this webinar extends to considering what role can be played by lawyers with respect to the situation in Ukraine already at this stage. During my presentation, I will briefly address two topics. First, I will address the importance of the victim's involvement in investigations and proceedings, not only in the interest of justice, but also in the interest of the victim themselves. And second, I will flag, although not exhaustively, challenges the victims of the war in Ukraine and lawyers eventually involved in the process may currently face. First of all, it should be emphasized that when investigating and prosecuting the most serious international crimes are concerned, the purpose of justice-making mechanism in not only to bring perpetrators to justice, but also to ensure the right of victims to truth and justice. In particular, Article 60, uh, 68, Paragraph 3 of the Rome Statute provides for the right of the victims to participate in the ICC proceedings at any stage. According to the ICC jurisprudence, victims play a central role in proceedings be before the ICC, and their participation should be effective and meaningful, not pure.
are not exclusively rules for the internal use of the ICC, but also define the parameters and model of the proceedings pertaining to the most serious international crimes to be used at the international or national level. Accordingly, victims shall have right to participate in any truth-seeking and justice-making mechanisms on either international or national level. The integral components of the victim's rights to truth and justice are the right to effectively contribute to the search for the truth and good justice, as well as the The experience has shown that the active participation of victims in the ICC proceedings not only effectively contributes to the establishment of the truth, as victims themselves are an important source of evidence, but is also a key element of the rehabilitation on their path to lasting peace. It is well known there can be no lasting peace without justice, but it, when it comes to the most serious international crimes, the victim's path to lasting peace is usually difficult and long. This path begins, begins with understanding and realizing what has happened to them, and includes finding ways to establish the truth and justice, participation in proceedings, bringing perpetrators to justice, reparation of harm, and often reconciliation with other members of the community. The inability to benefit from any of these components significantly complicates the path through rehabilitation and ultimately sustainable peace at the individual, family, and community levels. Experience has shown that the harm caused by the most serious international crimes can take many forms and manifest itself not only in the short term, but also in the long term. Experience violence or violence that a person has witnessed often leads to various forms of emotional, psychological, and mental disorders, which may not manifest themselves immediately, but only over time, and often leads to post-traumatic stress disorder. Psychological trauma and violence can be passed down through the generations in the form of transgenerational harm, which is transmitted from psychologically traumatized parents to their children and affects not only individuals, by, but also entire families and communities. The most serious international crimes often uh, also often lead to the loss of opportunities for personal and social development and hinder the implementation of life plans. The specificity of the situation in Ukraine in that active national and international investigations have already begun when the armed conflict is still ongoing. Although it's difficult to predict the future development and duration of this conflict, it can be reasonably anticipated that the first judicial proceedings may begin soon, at least at national level, and against first or mid-level perpetrators. The active involvement of the victims of the war in Ukraine in the procedures of investigations and future judicial proceedings is not only a key requirement for the realization of their right to truth and justice, but also an important element in the beginning of their rehabilitation Accordingly, such involvement should not be limited to providing information and testimony as witnesses, but should also include the opportunity for victims to provide details of their own experiences and the harm they have suffered as a result of the crimes committed against them. This is a key element in their right to be listened and to be heard. The first challenge here is how to help victims realize their right to truth and justice without affecting their psychological well-being. In fact, the instances of the victimization in Ukraine are very recent, and many victims are traumatized to various extent or otherwise extremely vulnerable. But the victimization of even those victims who managed to flee the war and are currently located in safe areas outside Ukraine is still continuous because in the circumstances of the ongoing conflict, they are continuously experiencing stress, emotional and psychological pressure not only because they are far away from their homes and simply because they worry about their relatives and friends who remain in Ukraine, they worry about their homes and more generally about their future. Given the large number of the victims, it can be anticipated that only a limited number of them have received so far comprehensive psychological assistance and support. Consequently, dealing with the victims of the war in Ukraine obviously requires the involvement of lawyers with experience in assisting victims of most serious international crimes and preferably psychologists to avoid or at least mitigate risks of re-traumatization. 
The second challenge or other risk, which is interrelated with the first one, is that it is very likely that same victims will be reached many times by different stakeholders currently involved in investigations on other truth-seeking or fact-finding activities in Ukraine, which also can be a source of re-traumatization. Indeed, since the beginning of the war, national authorities of Ukraine started their investigations into the committed crimes. At the beginning of March, uh, the ICC prosecutor opened an opened investigation into the situation in Ukraine. Shortly after, the United Nations Human Rights Committee established the International Commission of Inquiry into Ukraine. At the end of March, your just set up a joint investigation team on crimes committed in Ukraine, joined by the ICC prosecutor. It is possible that the similar commissions or joint investigation on fact finance teams in different formats will be established in the future. It is unclear for now how all these initiatives will coordinate and cooperate, but what it can be anticipated already that because of particular mandate and available resources for each to, of each to, stakeholder, not all, all of these different stakeholders will have sufficient experience and sp expertise and necessary tools to properly deal with the victims of the war in Ukraine. To emphasize again, most of them are traumatized or extremely vulnerable. The third challenge is how to trace and reach victims who are very numerous and presently displayed throughout Ukraine and outside. Many victims have been forcibly transferred to Russia. Other victims are currently located in temporarily occupied areas. And thus access to these victims is currently very difficult if possible at all. Those victims who fled the war to neighboring countries in the European Union did not necessarily remain in these countries, but continued moving to other European countries and outside Europe. The issue is that uh, not all the victims who are currently located in the European Union have been registered in the respective municipalities because this is not a requirement. In the circumstances tracing and reaching the victims of the war in Ukraine and dealing with the very large number of victims requires uniting and coordinating the efforts of lawyers, not only in Ukraine, but also abroad. In those countries where the victims of the war in Ukraine are currently temporarily located, and the last challenge, but nevertheless extremely important, is ways of dealings with the most traumatized and vulnerable victims, namely SGBV victims or victims of torture or inhuman or degrading treatment. It is well known that SGBV crimes are often underdiscovered, under underreported, and underinvestigated. The issue here is first how to help SGBV victims of the war in Ukraine come forward. And second, how to deal with the most traumatized and vulnerable category of victims in the context of investigations. To our knowledge, many SGBV victims of the war in Ukraine refuse to deal with national authorities for various reasons. But neither national authorities nor local NGOs operating in the field have sufficient experience and expertise to deal with these victims. They obviously need support of international experts in particular such matters as interviewing techniques and addressing various forms of harm suffered by these victims. But it seems that under the national legislation, for instance, foreign psychologists or experts on trauma cannot directly work in Ukraine without special authorization. At least the Ukrainian national authorities and local NGOs need to be provided with no delay with tailored trainings on relevant matters from international experts, which will obviously take time Although corresponding investigations in relation to the HGBV crimes are already ongoing. To conclude, the challenges I have just mentioned don't pretend to be exhaustive, but I believe they are indicative uh, of the areas where we as lawyers could consider deploying our efforts with the aim to help victims of the war in Ukraine realize their right to truth and justice already at this stage and despite the still ongoing conflict. I will stop here. I will be pleased to answer any question. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dimitri. Thank you very much, Dimitri and Paulina. And some questions have come in, though we encourage more. Um, I think that Renan is now back with us. Um, I, I thank you, Paulina. You began to answer uh, the question from 
I don't know whether it's Tobias Pilot or Tobias Pilot, but you began to answer uh, about how a common lawyer could get involved as such in a process before the ICC. Uh, I don't know whether, Renan, if you're back online with us, you want to add anything or if, if Paulina or Dimitri have more answers to that. R Renan, you didn't have a chance to, uh, to answer. Do you have any further comments to make following Paulina's comments? Thank you, Jonathan. I'm sorry you had a connection problem. No, Paulina did a superb uh, response. Uh, so that no, nothing else from my side. Thank you. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, Jonathan? Yes, please, Paulina, go ahead. If you allow me, I would like maybe to um, add something to the response for Bias. Um, first of all, I encourage uh, all lawyers attending the session to have a look at the ICC website. On the website, they will find information about uh, practicing as lawyers before the ICC, including how to join the list of counsel um, maintained by the registry of the ICC. All information are available online. It suffice to click on ICCCPI.int and then goes to defense or victims and you will find all information about, about that. I wanted also to clarify that there is a distinction in the system of the ICC between defense lawyers and victims lawyers. Uh, there is a general uh, right for defendants to choose their own lawyer. This is the same also for victims. However, considering the huge number of victims that normally participate in the proceedings, Normally, the court appoints one lawyer per group of victims, and this lawyer is known as common legal representative of victims. Why I am underlying this? It's because it could be that a victim will choose a lawyer to represent himself or herself, but that lawyer will be not ultimately appointed in the proceedings before the court because of these systems of common legal representation. However, the judges and chambers, therefore, will always assess the best interest of victims in the representation before making any appointment. Wonderful. Thank you for that clarification, Paulina. That is extremely helpful and useful. Uh, and more questions coming in. Dimitri, I don't know whether you have anything to add because there are more questions. Uh, do you have anything to add on the, anything said so far? Not for now, Nassim. No, okay. Uh, I'm delighted about the next question because it comes from an old friend of mine. I was very pleased to see her name come up. Lisa Kachinka. Welcome, Lisa, from Austria, uh, who is very well known and she was uh, very heavily involved at a senior level with the European uh, uh, Translators and Interpreters Association. And she asks a question about what is the language regime at the ICC and during investigations in terms of interpreting and translation. So I don't know who wants to answer that, but please go ahead. Uh, Paulina, go ahead. I will go for that. Uh, now, the official languages of the court are English and French. These, sorry, the working languages of the court are English and French. The official languages are all the six languages also used at the United Nations. So including then Spanish, Russian, uh, Chinese, and Arabic. However, proceedings are normally dealt with in English and French. At the level of investigation, the prosecution can receive information in different languages, including, of course, in this case, Ukrainian and Russian. Russian. However, it's much better if information are sent in one of the two working languages of the court because the ability and capacity, the resources that the court may have at that stage to translate material in other languages than English and French is very, very limited. So our advice to lawyers is always to file report or information 
in one of the two working languages of the court in the situation in Ukraine, it is our advice to try to file in English because the majority of the investigators of people involved in the Ukraine situation are English speaking. And therefore, any kind of material will be immediately um, readable uh, for them. Uh, I would like to underline that also for an issue of time. Uh, you can imagine that in an investigation, if you only receive information in a local language or in a language which is not a working language, it will take much more for the prosecution to review the material and make eventually um, is, is her mind in relation to that type of information. So this is the, in, the situation at the moment. Um, since the persons who made the answer is an interpreter or a translator, I think yes. um, there is a language service section at the ICC um, in charge of providing services to the different parties and participants in the proceedings. And at the moment, that section is also looking actively uh, for uh, interpreters and translator and translators um, with uh, Russian and Ukrainian language. And any information about positions for uh, interpreter and translation can be found on the ICC website at the vacancy window. Wonderful. Thank you for your very full and comprehensive and interesting response. Um, going through the questions, Karolina Jurashek, I hope I pronounce the names correct. She says, in November 2016, Russia announced that it was breaking its relations with the ICC by withdrawing its signature from the founding treaty, the Rome Statute, based on the decree of President Putin. How do we understand, therefore, the jurisdiction of the ICC in Ukraine? And again, I don't know who wants to answer. Uh, Paulina, you're going. Who wants to answer that one? Is that something for you later, uh, Esteban? I don't know, but... Uh, I would say Renan, because he touched Renan. on it. Um, Renan, you go. Thank you, Jonathan. Indeed, um, as I had indicated, neither Ukraine nor Russia are states parties. So in principle, the ICC would not have any jurisdiction. But Ukraine did submit two declarations, the ones that I had mentioned. Uh, and that is foreseen in the Rome Statute. There's an article that basically lets a non-state party say, exceptionally, we're going to give the ICC jurisdiction. And uh, we're going to do so as of this date. So Ukraine did that. And therefore, uh, that is the legal basis by which the ICC has jurisdiction for the crimes committed on the territory of Ukraine. Uh, that, that has to be clear. It's not for crimes committed elsewhere by, by anyone. And um, I believe the date that was in that declaration in the latter one basically indicated that the jurisdiction applies as of, let me just check my notes here. It was in 2000. Just give me one second, please. The 21st of November, 2013. The alleged crimes committed after the 21st of November, 2013, may be falling under the jurisdiction of the ICC based on that, those two declarations. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Anand. Very clear. Next question, and this is for uh, Council for Victims. Uh, so it's from Elisabetta Galiazzi. Um, and the question is, what is the role, if there is one, of victims in the proceedings before the national courts in the context of complementary and or universal jurisdiction? Particularly, can victims be represented in Ukrainian courts? Uh, if I may, I can, uh, I can answer. Please, go ahead. Uh, yeah, uh, the, the, the issue is that at this point in time, uh, I, I, I learned from the uh, from the media that the first uh, first trial in Ukraine has uh, been carried out in relation to uh, crime of mur murder of a civilian, and uh, the it was it was re very very recently. I'm not sure that whether victim 
victims' relatives were uh, represented in these proceedings. But uh, in principle, it should be, the, I mean, the representation of the, of the victim should be ensured in any proceeding, as I mentioned during my presentation, that because uh, uh, when we are talking about the most serious international crimes, the uh, model of the uh, uh, justice justice making mechanisms should be based on the on the provisions of the Rome statute statute, and the provisions of, of the Rome statute provides for the rights of, of the victims to participate in the proceedings in relation to any of the most serious international crimes, uh, both in international and national level. Answering the question that yes. Uh, in principle, victims should be represented in any proceedings, uh, either in, before the International Criminal Court or before the Ukrainian, the Ukrainian uh, courts or any other national jurisdictions. For now, uh, we don't know uh, how it will work at, at the Ukrainian level, because as mentioned, only the per first trial uh, has, been, has been carried out in this point in time, but, but in principle, uh, I, I anticipate that uh, um, uh, other proceedings will, will open soon in Ukraine because of the large, large uh, scope, uh, large number, large amount of, uh, of evidence already available. So answering your question, yes, the victim should be represented and uh, uh, in principle, Ukrainian court should ensure the involvement of the lawyer representing victims in proceedings before national jurisdictions. Thank you. Thank you, Dimitri. Very good. Uh, Renan, please pay attention because this one is a, 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 the question, I think, is addressed to you. Uh, and it's from Jacek Kowalewski, uh, who's an attorney at law from Poland. Um, and he says, um, the principle of complementarity has been mentioned. I would like to know what factors have been taken into account in deciding by the ICC that the ICC prosecutor shall indeed proceed with an investigation and that it's not enough that Ukraine and other states alone investigate. That's question one. And then do you know how this specific analysis is being addressed by the ICC or other actors throughout the already ongoing ICC investigation so that Ukraine itself becomes more ready to investigate and prosecute international crimes with the possible effect of limiting the ICC activities. I understand various lawyers could be of assistance in raising the preparedness of Ukraine to prosecute. Sorry, long question. I hope you got it all and I assume it's Renan. So over to you, Renan. Thank you. I'll try to answer that. I, I have to answer the question in a general sense because I, I cannot refer to a specific situation. But indeed, uh, when, when the ICC is investigating and there are national proceedings going on in any given situation, the question will arise and the ICC will ask, are these investigations in country X genuine? Are they looking at the same facts that we want to look at? You know, we, we, we receive, let's say there are 100 situations in a given country and, and, and the prosecutor has to see which of those, you know, he can get more evidence on, where, where he can make a more solid case, where he can file the charges. So what, what we do at the national level as well. He has to pick, he has to pick. And then he has to check if whatever the country is doing on its own uh, coincides. Are they the same people? Are they the same crimes? Is the threshold the same? So there is a myriad number of factors that the prosecutor of the ICC will look at. And then again, because we have to be complementary, uh, the prosecutor will ask the authorities of that country, can you tell me what are you doing in this specific situation? Can you share with me this information? The, uh, the prosecutor will send his team there to look and liaise with the national authorities and remember, it's not necessarily the government, it's you know whoever's in charge over there uh, to see exactly what the situation is. And he will formally give an opportunity for that country to explain you know, what they are doing, what they are looking at. And, and that happens at the level of the prosecutor. And then the states may say, look, you should not be looking into this thing because I'm already doing that. My legal system is dealing with it. You know, and I have a very good functional legal system, et cetera, et cetera. So at some point, of course, the prosecutor will make his or her decision, uh, but also the pretrial chamber will have to say something if, if the investigation is genuine or not. So this is the explanation I can give, uh, again, from a very general sense. We, I don't think any of us can get into the details of uh, the specific situation in Ukraine. It's really so recent as well. We're still collecting the evidence from, from all sides. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Next, no, 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 can I add please, something Carolina, to the yes, explanation yes. of Renan? Um, for on the point of view of, of the practice of a court, 
And normally the ICC um, chambers evaluate this principle of complementarity and the prosecutor as well, um, looking at two criteria. One is the ability of a national jurisdiction to investigate and prosecute. And the second is the willingness of the national jurisdiction to investigate and prosecute. Now, I think that in the situation in Ukraine, we are assisting to a um, very peculiar situation in the sense that we are contemporaneous to the event. And now it's the first time for the ICC that this happens. So uh, to some extent, we are in different situation from the other situations that in the past were referred to the court and are still ongoing. I'm uh, noting that because we may easily be in the position in which there is a concurrence of jurisdiction from the national authorities and from the prosecution in the sense that maybe the national authorities are centrally able and willing to investigate and prosecute, but they will not have enough resources to deal with the extent of the crimes that at the time are being committed on the soil of Ukraine. So in this sense, there might be for the first time a sort of concurrence um, of investigation and prosecution at the international level before the ICC and at the national level um, in, in Ukraine. Very good. Thank you, Paulina. Very, very clear. Uh, next question from Mikhail Garcia Estebe. Uh, it's going back to the, uh, the question we've also touched on. What will happen if Russia doesn't recognize the International uh, Criminal Court? What can we do in, in this case? Who wants to take the lead on that? I, I, I may have to try that again. Um, well, we have something which is basically the international cooperation, which is necessary with the gathering of evidence. I mean, if you're going to have arrest warrants. Um, but there is, and that's one of the constraints that we have, there is no coercive system for the ICC. We don't have an ICC police gendarmerie or, or whatever you want to call it that can go out and you know capture someone so this is a challenge that we have already faced when we have issued arrest warrants and and sometimes the states have not been willing to cooperate we then of course go to the security council in some cases because they refer situations to us even the security council with all its power doesn't necessarily you know facilitate the uh, matters so this is a challenge for which uh, we don't have a, a quick answer uh what we can say is of course that we hope that at some point there are factors which would allow those states to, to cooperate with the court, uh, which initially may not be able to. Sometimes there are um, simply change in circumstances. Sometimes uh, political winds change as well in different countries. There are elections and, and, and the, new, uh, the new authorities have a different view. And, and basically that's all we can do at this stage. Because when you're dealing with a state party, we do have a procedure uh, to try to encourage cooperation because you're basically breaking your commitments of the statute. So you're, 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 you're not cooperating, but you have a legal regime for that. When you're dealing with a non-state party, you're in a different situation. Unless there's a security council resolution under chapter seven, uh, the non-state party simply says, this does not apply to me. Thank you. Very good, thank you. Uh, an interesting question now coming from, uh, we still have uh, a few minutes, seven minutes left before we go to the next session. Very good and interesting questions coming. Ricardo Izquierdo says, given the usually large amount of organizations working on documenting international crimes, the risk of subjecting victims to repeated questions by different actors is today perhaps more prevalent than ever. What is your advice for civil society organizations documenting such crimes to prevent continued re-victimization even before any material is submitted to national authorities or the ICC. So who would like to go on this? Paulina, do you want to go? Or Dimitri, I don't know. Who's I, got I think that Dimitri, uh, Dimitri. already pointed out uh, very well the, this challenge and also indicating that there is a need also of uh, being aware on how to approach vulnerable victims in particular victims of sexual and gender-based crimes, children, I would like to mention children, 
because in Ukraine we had bombardment of schools, pediatric hospitals. It, 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 so even children, and I would like to underline that because crimes affecting and against children are to some extent overlooked uh, at, at the moment. Um, so I think it's very important to be prepared to speak with victims. Um, there are techniques that lawyers are advised to use when interacting with, with vulnerable witnesses and victims. And there are ways of addressing victims differently, depending on the type of crimes that they suffer from, depending on the age, depending on their current situation, they are in a displaced space, they are still in Ukraine, they are still in, in places which are being bombarded. So there are really different techniques. So what I think it's important for a lawyer is to equip herself or himself with uh, these tools in order to be able to minimize to some extent the re-traumatization of, of victims. Uh, second, I would like to underline that organization of different efforts towards accountability and justice is essential. There must be a way of coordinating all the efforts to have justice for Ukraine, also with the intent and purpose of trying to avoid re-traumatization of victims who may be in contact with different stakeholders. Um, as office, we have already, we had already some discussions with different groups. We are, be, we are very open to discuss with any other interest in, in common effort on how to deal with that. And also the last uh, thing, it's important to have psychologists trained in Ukraine to be able to support the efforts of lawyers in this regard. Thank you, Paulina. Dimitri, anything to add or we move on? Uh, we can, we can uh, move on. I guess. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I mean, there's a, another question about that same point, but let's go to Ina Hameni, uh, who said, is my, who asks, is my understanding correct? Any victim can contact directly or through his or her lawyer, the ICC prosecutor, in order to give information and to initiate uh, the case. Uh, what is the way of contacting the prosecutor's office? So who wants to take that? Can I, can yeah. I uh, ahead, say please. something? Yes, in principle, any anyone, any person can contact the office of the prosecutor in relation to the uh, visa information information in, in his or her possession to provide the official prosecutor with this information. The issue is that, uh, to our knowledge, at this point in time, already uh, several thousand of uh, communications have been uh, submitted to the office of the prosecutor uh, of the court in relation to the situation in Ukraine. And of course, we cannot uh, make an analysis of the quality of this information, but it can be anticipated that, that it's unlikely that these communications are uh, sufficiently systematized or organized. So this means that uh, also any any person, including victims, can contact directly the office of the prosecutor. It's much better that this information or these communications are prepared and provided by lawyers, because obviously uh, lawyers can know better how to organize this, how to structure this information, how to link the events to particular crimes. And uh, this systematized information would be of much help for the office of the prosecutor to process this information, to make an analysis and to take, as mentioned already by, by Paulina, it can also help the office of the prosecutor to focus uh, better the scope of, of its investigations. So answering your question, so yes, anyone can contact. However, it's much better that this information is provided by lawyers. And uh, the ways to contact the office of the prosecutor on the website of the court, you can find a specific uh, specific uh, uh, sections sections where you can find uh, uh, an email address the office of the prosecutor can be contacted through. And also, there is a, a portal, a special portal available on the website when you can click on it, and uh, you will be guided uh, as to how or which kind of inf information is needed at this point in time. And you can uh, you can do it on this on these two ways. And on the portal, 
it's essential that anyone providing information does it um, with details. Um, if you look at the portal, the location of events will be required, the dates, uh, some details are required. And it's important that you complete it uh, very well because the portal will be searched by keywords or whatever. There is a system that the prosecution will use and it will be much easier for them to detect the information if all the details are included in the pathway. Very good. Thank you very much. We have two further questions, uh, and uh, but what I'm going to propose is that the two further questions are the opening questions in our general question and answer session, which will follow our next session. We're exactly at the time for the next session. We shouldn't uh, uh, delay it. So we can think about those two questions and come to them uh, at the end. So uh, we'd now like to move on uh, to the last substantive session before we have more questions, uh, and that is universal jurisdiction. Jurisdiction. Uh, and our speaker is Esteban Peralta Lozia, Professor of Public International Law at the University of Saragossa in Spain. Um, and uh, he's uh, a Professor of Public International Law and International Relations. Uh, he has had a long uh, a connection with the International Criminal Court. Uh, between 2003 and 2022, uh, he was Chief of the council support section at the registry of the ICC and before that uh, for a period he was associate legal officer in chamber one of the international tribunal uh, for the former Yugoslavia. He has a master's in law and a doctor in law from the University of Saragossa and a master in uh, European communities from the, excuse my Spanish, Real Instituto de Estudios e Europeos. Uh, so very good, Esteban. I won't uh, put torture you any more with my Spanish. It's over to you and your topic. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, let me thank James and Alonso for their invitation to this event and rejoice to be sharing your screen with my dear and admired Jonathan Goldsmith and with good friends and former colleagues such as Renan Villacis, Paulina Masida, and Dimitro Supron. The CCB is an institution with which I have worked closely during my years of service to the ICC and very dear to me for many reasons. And although I am back to academia, I remain committed to cooperate with the legal profession and most particularly with the CCB in any way I can. For my intervention of today, I propose to start differentiating universal jurisdiction from other institutions that might be confused with it, to make the point on the current situation in the practice of different states, and to conclude by considering which role it may play in the situation of Ukraine. In the absence of an international normative instrument that regulates universal jurisdiction, the Princeton principles on universal jurisdiction are a document adopted by a group of academics and practitioners in 2001. They are therefore not a legal text, but the definition is useful to put some borders to the concept of universal jurisdiction, which is defined as criminal jurisdiction based solely on the nature of the crime without regard to where the crime was committed, the nationality of the alleged or convicted perpetrator, the nationality of the victim or any other connection to the state exercising such jurisdiction. Universal jurisdiction is thus different to other concepts such as extraterritoriality in that there is no connection point with the state exercising the use puniendi. That its basis is the consideration of the crimes as violation of obligations, erga omnes, general obligations, to which general obligation of prosecuting and punishing is linked. In cases of extraterritoriality, a state can derogate from the general principle of territoriality of criminal law. That is that a state can only prosecute and punish crimes that have allegedly been committed in its territory to include certain acts that the state deems necessary to punish itself, 
such as crimes against its security or its nationals. Another particular case is when the state decides to prosecute its nationals who may have committed certain crimes outside its territory. Extraterritoriality can also be achieved by way of international treaties and several instruments establish the principle audedere audiudicare, according to which a state has the obligation to prosecute the alleged authors of a crime or to extradite them to another state that, that wants to do so. Conventions against torture or terrorism are examples of the establishment of this principle. In particular, there is no universal jurisdiction incorporated into the Rome Statute, which maintains a double alternative rule for the exercise of its jurisdiction, that the crime be committed in the territory of a state party or by a national of, of a state party, well, the, when, with the well-known exception of the referral of a situation by the Security Council. Of course, it is quite a safe bet to say that this latter trigger of the court's jurisdiction will likely not be used in the case we are discussing today. In any case, the concept of the ICC as a court of last resort means that the preference to prosecute those crimes that it can also prosecute itself will fall on those countries who have jurisdiction over them the natural choice would be that it be Ukraine that exercises such jurisdiction, as most of the crimes that are likely to be prosecuted have been committed in its territory. Crime of aggression and command responsibility issues might also be prosecuted in Russia, should there ever be a will to do so. Universal jurisdiction appears periodically on our timelines and is always controversial. Most states are reticent to the prosecution under universal jurisdiction in the national orders. And most of those that adopted ambitious regulations on the issue rectified and went for a lower profile consideration. The position of many states can be illustrated by a recent statement of the Dutch Public Prosecution Service related to the arrest of a Rwandan former army officer suspected of genocide, who was, uh, I mean, whose extradition had been requested by uh, Rwanda. The final paragraph of the statement said, the Dutch public prosecutor takes the approach that investigation and prosecution of international crimes are to take place as much as possible in the country where the crimes were committed, as that is where the evidence is, where the participants in the criminal proceedings are knowledgeable of the language, culture, and backgrounds of events, and where in general, most of the victims and surviving relatives are located. Other reasons for such reticence are basically two. The will to avoid diplomatic frictions that would appear by prosecuting high profile officials of other states and the hope to discourage other countries to attempt from attempting such actions against its own leaders. In Belgium, for instance, the 10 years of the law of universal jurisdiction led to a high number of cases before the national courts, including such high profile cases uh, accused, uh, sorry, as Ariel Sharon, Yasser Arafat, George Herbert Walker Bush, so Bush the father, Colin Powell, and Dick Cheney. In Spain, the 1985 law on the organization of the judicial power opened the door for the prosecution under juris uh, universal jurisdiction before the Spanish courts. But it was amended twice, once in 2009, and then again in 2014, to include conditions under which the Spanish courts could proceed by introducing connection points, such as the nationality of residence of the presumed author, that in fact suppress, sorry, that in fact suppress the universal jurisdiction from the Spanish legal order the Spanish legal order, at least as defined 
in the Princeton principles. This amendment validated by the Spanish Constitutional Court greatly reduced the number of cases in the country. The German Code of Crimes Against International Law of 2002, on the other hand, opens the door to many other possibilities as, a, as it applies the general criminal law to all crimes in the Rome Statute, even when the offense was committed abroad and bears no relation to Germany, as it's section one states. This allowed the higher regional court at Koblenz to find two Syrian intelligence officers, Eyad al-Kharib and Anwar Raslan, if the name is of any interest to you, guilty of crimes against humanity and to send them to prison. In France, on the other hand, the Cour de Cassation declared in November 2021 that the French judiciary was incompetent to prosecute the accused as the alleged crimes were not punishable in Syrian law. It bears mentioning that the French case and the German case were closely related and the investigations were carried out by both prosecutions uh, in a coordinated manner. So uh, the, the result, as you can see, was completely different in one case and in one country and in the other. In connection with the Russian invasion of Ukraine, some countries have opened their own investigations such as Germany, Lithuania, Sweden, or Spain. In addition, a total of 41 states parties to the Rome Statute, as Renan has reminded us in the beginning, have requested the prosecutor to open an investigation on the basis of the declarations accepting the court jurisdiction that Ukraine lodged on 9 April 2014 and 8 September 2015, the latter being made for an indefinite duration. And also, as has also been explained, the prosecutor has undertaken an unprecedented effort to cooperate with national authorities of Ukraine and other countries to raise funds, 20 states having made contributions, and constitute a team that has already started investigating crimes in the Ukrainian territory. This team comprises today 42 investigators, including national experts seconded by 21 states. This, without prejudice indeed, of the possibility for the Ukrainian prosecution and judiciary to prosecute the crimes, especially on basis of Articles uh, 109, actions aimed at forceful change or overthrow of the constitutional order or takeover of government, 110, trespass against territorial integrity and inviolability of Ukraine, 437, planning, preparation, and waging of an aggressive war, 438, violation of rules of warfare, 439, use of weapons of mass destruction, 441, ecocide, 442, genocide, 443, etc., etc., etc. In this regard, the Office of the Prosecutor General of Ukraine has stated that it is looking into more than 10,000 potential war crimes, including killings and cases of torture involving more than 600 suspects, including Russian soldiers and government officials. In this same week, as has been already mentioned before, we have seen a first case where a Russian soldier appearing before a district court in Kiev has pleaded guilty to having killed a civilian. And I have also, although I have paid special attention to this matter, I haven't seen any mention of victims being represented before the, before the, the court, although of course uh, the widow of the victim had uh, testified. This is indeed the first step towards the management of the situation in its natural fashion, that is before the Ukrainian courts, although there can be few doubts that this course of action will leave many gaps. Also, the, the Russian judiciary could prosecute these crimes on the basis of, the, of Section 12 of the 1996 Criminal Code of the Russian Federation. In particular, it's Articles 353, 
356, 57, 58, 59, and 60. Also, the Russian judiciary might also have the obligation to, of referring a case to the Ukrainian authorities under Article 32 of the Russian Federation Criminal Procedure Code that states that if the crime was initiated at a place under the jurisdiction of one court and completed at a place to which is spread the jurisdiction of another court, the given criminal case shall be referred to the jurisdiction of the court at the place where the crime was complete. This, as I mentioned, was regarding the national orders of the places where the crimes appear to have been committed or alleged crimes appear to have been committed. We have also international response. The Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, formed by members of the parliaments of the 46 member states of the organization, has requested that the Council of Europe that already expelled Russia on 16 March 2022, creates an international criminal tribunal under among others, I'm not going to read the whole resolution to you, don't worry, uh, under the following terms, to investigate and prosecute the crime of aggression, to apply the definition of this crime as established international law, to have the power to issue international arrest warrants and not be limited by state immunity or the immun immunity of any state officials, to be set up by in the form of a multilateral treaty and with support of the Council of U Europe, U EU and other international organizations and continues the parliamentary assembly. Of course, it's uh, uh, putting forward their own interests to have its headquarters in Strasbourg in view of possible synergies with the European Court of Human Rights. This parliamentary assembly resolution calls thus for a multilateral exercise of universal jurisdiction limited to the crime of aggression, given the possibility for the International Criminal Court to investigate and prosecute genocide, crimes of war, and crimes against humanity in the territory of Ukraine. The foreign affairs committees of 13 European states have also issued a statement along the same lines. This statement, it must be said, it's a tiny bit for me disappointing in that it gathers a much smaller constituency than the parliamentary assembly resolution. And in that many of the, let's call heavyweight states of Europe, such as Germany, France, Italy, or Spain are missing. Universal jurisdiction, in my opinion, should be a last resort institution to be used only when no other cause of action can ensure the prosecution of those responsible for the most heinous crimes. And therefore, I have a few uh, ideas that I want to put forward uh, and that can be uh, put in practice by some by policymakers, some by any lawyer or any association representing victims. And and these ideas would be, uh, first of all, apply the existing competence rules. Second, pursue a multilateral exercise by like-minded states, but as wide as possible to ensure as, as wide as possible a representation of the international community and taking special care of ensuring a scrupulous respect of all the requirements of the due process principle. Also make an effort to train Ukrainian legal professionals, prosecutors, lawyers, judges, to increase their competence regarding the crimes that allegedly have been committed during the invasion. From the point of view, more specifically for the, from the point of view of uh, any lawyer or, or an association representing victims, I think that the first step should be to establish the strongest, largest possible network 
and coordinate actions so as not to create applications. The second contribute to the training of legal professionals to which I have uh, referred earlier. Also to assess the requirement of different national systems to prosecute individuals. For instance, residents need to attend uh, the procedures in person because they, there are countries where you can uh, have a, a, a trials in absentia, but there are others that don't allow for it, uh, et cetera, in order to ensure an effective forum choice, meaning in order to bring a case before the judicial system that has more chances to go forward with the process and to eventually find guilty the accused if that's if we are the accusers of course there are and there is another one which is to map uh, the residence of movements of potential targets that can only be done with that uh, network that i have mentioned earlier and the last one and that I, I mean it covers i think all the all the previous uh, ideas that I have uh, put forward, to take all decisions on the basis of their potential effectiveness and not on expected media effects or any other considerations that can diminish the effectiveness, the effectiveness before the courts. The situation created by the Russian invasion of Ukraine is exceptional for many reasons. And it requires a strong response from all European law, law professionals, individually and collectively. The institutional response is for now at two levels, the national judiciary and the International Criminal Court. The evolution of events will tell us if there is further multilateral reaction, in particular through an aggression court, and if there are national cases on the basis of each country's regulations regarding prosecution of these crimes. In any case, I think that the legal community is already committed to intervene actively in, in this response. And I just uh, hope that it is coordinated and effective. And with this, I finish my intervention. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you so much, Esteban. That was uh, excellent and very clear. Um, there may well have been one question, I mean, the questions are really for everybody as we've seen, but given that you haven't answered a question, uh, I think there may be one question that arrived during your, uh, your presentation, so I'll ask it to you, I'm taking it out of order. Um, it's, um, uh, it comes from an anonymous attendee and it said, wouldn't the ICC be seen as more impartial in judging major crimes committed in Ukraine by Russia than the Ukrainian jurisdictions. How can this issue be dealt with considering the primary responsibility of the national authorities to prosecute? So you have a go, and if other people want to answer, that's absolutely fine. Well, my, my first reaction to this is that the principle, again, is the preference of the national jurisdiction, in this case of Ukraine, and that the I think that there is a, a presumption of impartiality of the judicial power of, uh, I mean, of, of any country, and in in particular in the case of Ukraine, this judicial power and its decisions are submitted to the higher jurisdiction of the European Court of Human Rights. So we have there a guarantee, and also I think that uh, any judicial power uh, deserving such a name should uh, be not only very attentive to the to the impartiality of its proceedings but also in a situation like this one because of a matter of perception from outside i mean i think that the, the ukrainian judiciary should and will i'm sure be very very careful extremely careful that the proceeding the proceedings before them cannot be perceived as being biased or partial from the from the external observers 
Very good. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know if anybody wants to add to that. Uh, uh, sorry, you... sorry, Jonathan. Can please, I can I just uh, uh, just add something? It's a very uh, interesting comment or question uh, put by the particip participant. Uh, uh, indeed, the Ukrainian uh, Ukrainian jurisdiction should ensure, or Ukrainian law should ensure, the impartiality of all judges in in Ukraine. However, it it could be a sort of a perception of a general bias in Ukraine, given the extent of the of this war. So this means even the, uh, I, I I would I would say that uh, every particular Ukrainian has uh, has been affected to various extent by this war, including eventually the judges who will be involved in in in. Uh, 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 in trying the, uh, the the perpetrator, so this means it could be a sort of perception of general bias. But I agree, of course, this is one that, in any case, this is responsibility of the state to ensure that all the judges involved, including these proceedings, should be uh, should be absolutely impartial because this is a requirement of the uh, fair fair uh, fair trial uh, uh, guarantees. Very good, thank you, Renan. You've got your hand up. Speak, please. Thank you. Just briefly to add to this discussion that there has been in the broader context of, of ICC work, you know, um, advantages, disadvantages identified. And one is that, you know, the trial should take place near where the events took place, near the victims, and not in some far flung, you know, corner of Europe, because again, our crimes can be anywhere around the world. So that's another factor where I think people, um, you know, tend to say, you know, let the justice be local. Uh, the, if the system is not working, that's a different matter. But if the system works, basically, then that's where you should have it. It also makes it easier. You can have, you know, instead of bringing 10 people to The Hague, uh, dealing with interpreters and witness protection, putting them on planes, sometimes you can't even fly them over. You know, you can have 1,000, 10,000 people at the local trial. They know the system. They know the rules. The ICC is a very complex and convoluted procedure that not, not even those of us who've been here for years sometimes fully understand, I have to admit, uh, it's, it's a tough one. So there are advantages and disadvantages, but there's also the perception, justice should be in your country. You know, so, some areas of the world have been subject to, you know, a lot of outside influence, and I'm saying that mildly, they don't want some distant, you know, person who looks very different from me, judging, you know, what's happening in my backyard. So there's a little bit of that to bear in mind. Thank you. Paulina, please. I'm sorry, it's that the debate is very interesting and uh, just following up with what Renani said on the point of view of the victims, at least in my experience, it's very important for the victims to feel next to where justice is being done. And justice in your country can certainly not be substituted by something internationally, which you may feel very distant from you, as Renan was also, was also saying. So there is also this component, I think, to, to take into account in, in, in this debate and how victims can maybe sometimes better contribute uh, in their national systems in getting justice in, in, in the victimization being understood. And also sometimes in immediacy, the International Criminal Court um, proceedings can last long um, so this is also, I think, an aspect that we could um, take into account. Very good. Very interesting comments. I assume that's an old hand, Renan. So I'll move to the next question. This is a holdover. This is for the two victims speakers. Um, and it follows on, really, from what was said before. It's from an, an anonymous attendee. And it says, as a lawyer, you feel a great responsibility to be there for the victims and make sure they're being heard. This is a difficult task as they're severely traumatized. Is there any forum for lawyers to debrief and get support to be able to handle this and handle victims in the best way. And actually, uh, I wonder whether we should take, um, uh, we could take the last question, and I'm sorry to jump across them, from Sandra Gil Guzman, um, who, who's, who asked a roughly similar question, which is to do with training. Can the court organize training for lawyers who've never participated in the international criminal justice system, but who are keenly interested in participating? It's a different question, but with some uh, similarity. So who wants to go first on that? Well, uh, for the first question, um, there is not, I would say, a, a forum per se. Uh, if my understanding of the question is correct, it deals also with how interacting with victims may affect lawyers themselves and how lawyers can respond to that. 
Now, um, there is no uh, dedicated forum or fora, I would say, but certainly there are mechanisms that lawyers can um, put in place to preserve to some extent also themselves uh, in order also to be objective in the work that they do. Because very often as lawyers for victims, you, you empathize with your client much more than with a defendant, I think, particularly in terms of, of mass crimes. So there is a need also to preserve your, your objectivity in order to be able to really represent the best interest of your clients. Um, at the office, what we do, we can only suggest that as an advice, um, lawyers at the office follow different trainings uh, and they have also available the services of psychologists or any other person that counselors uh, that can be of help, uh, particularly um, if young lawyers are involved, and also something that maybe could be useful for lawyers um, when we from the office uh, go in the field, uh, we tend not to go to go alone, uh, to go at least in two people, uh, preferably with different gender. Um, very often, victims may be willing to speak to a male lawyer or some other times to a female. Uh, sometimes they don't have a, a difference but try to, to think of how a client could feel in speaking with a lawyer maybe for the first time and how you could empathize to some extent, um, try to find out which location best suits the first, for instance, the first meeting. So these are all um, arrangements that may uh, help lawyers to create or reinforce the trust relationship with lawyers when we are dealing with clients um, who suffer these kinds of, of crimes that we are discussing today. Um, before giving the floor to Dimitri, if he has something to add on that, on the second question for the training, um, the uh, council support section within the registry, which is the section dealing with uh, lawyers before the ICC, um, administratively, uh, also includes trainings, um, a yearly training um, for lawyers. Um, however, um, if anybody wants to have any information about availability of other trainings, there are a lot of trainings, um, webinars, uh, summer courses available. Uh, I think that um, my email and Dimitri's email will be shared after this session and we will be more than willing to eventually send a list of available courses. Uh, we also, Dimitri, myself, and other members of the office are very often involved in uh, um, training for lawyers. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for reminding me. We will show, uh, as Paulina just said, Paulina and Dimitri's email addresses at the end on a slide so that you can see it. Dimitri, do you have anything to add to what Pauline has said? No, nothing. Paulina has covered uh, uh, all, mainly all the all the uh, measures under this for this question. Okay, very good. Um, and uh, so we have. Well, actually, <laughs> no. Let's go in the order because the ne there's a new question which is relevant. But uh, let's go. Karolina Jurajek uh, says that in July uh, 2008, a Serbian judge authorized the transfer of the former Bosnian Serb leader Radovan Karadzic to the Hague. How will Russia hand over criminals uh, with Russian citizenship? Uh, this is rather like um, ah, uh, Alonso has put the uh, put the slide up. Um, thank you, Alonso. Uh, Alonso, can you take it down again and we put it up again at the end uh, so that we can go to the questions? Um, thank you. We'll put that up again at the end. Uh, so I don't know whether any, I mean, this is really, Renan, you talked about this somewhat uh, at the beginning about there's no police force, the ICC doesn't have its police or agents can seize. I don't know whether, or anybody who wants to uh, to add to this uh, and answer Carolina's question. Well, maybe again, uh, it, it is about cooperation. And uh, again, things happen. You, you cannot have a non-state party 
you can oblige them to do something. You can entice them sometimes. And I think that has happened in the case that was referred to in the question. There was an enticement uh, for one particular uh, state to cooperate. Uh, you have people who go on, you know, medical emergencies sometimes to other countries. They have to fly through a certain airspace. They have to land. So there, there are means of, uh, I think, uh, trying to get the, the individual involved at a certain case. But there's no, there's no real coercive measure to be able to enforce a cooperation, which is not legally binding, I have to say. Okay, very good. Nicola Steb has a question saying, uh, how can she find out whether investigations or, or maybe it's a man, sorry, how can Nicola, I should say it that way, how can Nicola find out whether investigations or proceedings are already going on concerning uh, somebody and the example given is Afghanistan and the Taliban. Um, uh, the lawyer would also need details like the time and the place to judge if the lawyer's client is a victim and can add some proof. So how can a lawyer find out whether there are relevant proceedings going on? Anybody want to answer that? Paulina. Well, I understand at the national level, I think the question target national jurisdiction. Now, there are a number of organizations who um, help victims in uh, in in searching justice at the national level and in on their website you may find relevant information you can have a look at the website of civitas maxima in geneva or trial international um very recently i think the Ash has published a report universal jurisdiction 2022 uh in which uh, there is a review of all the different um, cases in national jurisdiction uh, in relation to crimes also under the jurisdiction of the ICC. Um, I think this could be the answer. Um, yeah, I would go for that. Thank you, thank you. Uh, two further questions and then we will end. It's coming perfectly to the end. A question from Stanislav Sokur. Is there any guide available for lawyers who are willing to submit or request information uh, to the ICC on behalf of the victim. So is there any guide for victims' lawyers? Uh, no, there is no uh, guidance published, um, mainly, I guess, because it really depends on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, we have developed at the office some guidelines that we use uh, when we interact with the prosecution or when we provide information to the prosecution, uh, we will be willing to eventually have a conversation with anybody who may be interested in the specific situation in Ukraine. Thank you. Uh, before, there's just an announcement from Francois Cantier saying uh, that he wishes to launch the idea of an international project to support Ukrainian justice and especially uh, lawyers of victims. So uh, anybody who's interested in that can contact uh, Francois. Otherwise, we take our last question from Eamon Conlon, uh, who thanks you, Paulina, for your very helpful tips on engaging with victims, survivors, witnesses, but asks, how can lawyers ensure that they do not contaminate evidence when helping to gather it so that it's usable by the relevant authorities? Who's going to answer that? No, if Dimitri wants to intervene, I can start maybe. Dimitri? Well, thank you very much. It's a very important issue, actually, the issue of contamination. Um, there are, by the way, some guidelines by the International Institute for Criminal Investigation on how to proceed. So you can also access the IICI.org, I think, but it's well known. So if you Google International in Institute for Criminal Investigation, you will got it. Uh, they have some guidelines for lawyers and training also for lawyers on how to do it. Um, generally, what is important, first of all, is to understand correctly what the source is telling you. Uh, I would like to underline that because very often uh, international investigation happens with investigators not speaking the language of, the, for instance, the person interviewed. And in the international criminal court context, it could be an issue at the trial level if ever we will arrive at any trial. So it's very important to 
if you do not understand the language, to have a very good uh, interpreter with you and to always uh, check more than one time with the person that you are interviewing. I'm thinking of uh, potential witnesses at the moment, um, what the person is saying to you. When a lawyer takes the account, it's very important to read back that account to the person so that the person can confirm the exact uh, text of the account being given. Um, in relation to, and also um, very often, it, it's, it's the way in which questions are posed, it's very important. So try to remain as objective as possible. Do not use leading questions. Um, have the person really speaking freely about what happened to him or her uh, and try to be as precise as possible. Uh, again, um, in dealing with um, our own uh, um, discussions with victims, um, Council of the Office has adopted certain guidelines on which type of question is worth posing and in which way. And again, this is a knowledge that is eventually available to, to any lawyer. The office has also the task of supporting and assisting external lawyer, assisting victims, so we can be approached for that. Um, and also um, in relation to the documents, because evidence can be documental, video, um, witnesses, it can be everything. Uh, for the uh, documental evidence, it's very important the authenticity of the source. So how to establish the authenticity of the source, how to be sure that this document is really coming from the office, for instance. Uh, for video, it's very important to record the date, the time, uh, who took it. The chain of custody of evidence is also very important. Um, I'm a little bit brainstorming here because it's a huge issue. There are a lot of things to be taken into account, but just to give you uh, an extent of, of what could be useful to think of when dealing with this issue. Thank you. I don't know whether anybody wants to add. We don't, we've really run out of time. Dimitri, if you have anything vital to add, add it, but very quickly because... Uh... Yes, Jonathan, just one, one thing very quickly in relation to the previous, uh, previous question on the way to, to provide information on behalf of the victims. Uh, again, there are no, as mentioned by Pauline, there's no guidelines as such. However, uh, the main principle should be to put in information on systematized, structured and organized manner, uh, better to focus on, uh, to provide this information per event based on the principle, what happened, when happened, what, the, what are the available sources, who are victims, who are witnesses. And this information can be provided to both national authorities and uh, or the ICC Office of the Prosecutor. And just uh, the important thing, don't uh, attempt at this point in time to collect detailed witness or victims statements at this point in time, because in any case, any authorities, either national or international authorities would proceed with uh, collection uh, witness statements, detailed witness statements uh, at a later stage. So what is needed at this point in time is uh, the, the information which is uh, properly structured, organized, and uh, um, and and uh, not not extremely important, not extremely lengthy. Thank you. Very and on top of everything, please remember the principle: do not arm. If you see that the person is distressed, tired, traumatized. Please keep that in mind. The mental health and security and dignity of the person is much more important than providing evidence sometimes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I will, on behalf of all the participants, thank our panelists very much indeed for that excellent, excellent presentation. Alonso, thank you, has shared on the screen uh, the email uh, addresses of Paulina, Dimitri and Esteban. If you have questions, uh, Nicola Steb has said that she was referring to the ICC, he or she was referring to the ICC level, uh, not the national level. Uh, Francois Cantier has put uh, his email address fpaulcantier at gmail.com if you want to get in touch with him. Uh, Inna Harmini, I'm sorry we can't take your question because we've run out of time. I just remind you uh, that the next webinar will be on the 15th of June on the question of sanctions. Publicity and registration will be out next week. And it just remains for me to thank 
our panelists once again, and all of you, our participants, for your very interesting questions and for your attention. Thank you very much. That is now the end of this seminar. Bye-bye.